time of worship. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Antil Maribad. I'm requesting now uh, over to Pastor Alex to share about the parable of the unforgiving servant. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord and greetings to each and every one of you in the sweet and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is coming very, very soon. We are here with another very powerful and uh, very practical parable this evening, the parable of the unforgiving servant, before which I just want to lift my hands and, and bless each and every one of you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I pray that you shall be blessed according to God's word. And I pray that your children shall be blessed according to God's word, your jobs and businesses, your health, your mission, and your ministries, and all your prayers shall be answered in God's time. And uh, let the name of Jesus be exalted and glorified in our families. I pray that all shall be well with us. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 and amen. Hallelujah. Once again, I just want to greet you. We're going to learn from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 onwards. And uh, a small introduction about this uh, very powerful parable today. Sister Asha will be teaching us from this very powerful parable. So I request uh, uh, if you can switch on your videos, uh, please switch on your videos so that it will be an encouragement for each and every one of us. So especially to the teachers, when we see your face, it will be an encouraging thing too. This parable, well, in just one or two words, I just want to bring it before you. Uh, this is one of a very powerful, practical parable, which has been given more importance by Jesus Christ of Nazareth, because this parable teaches about the power of forgiveness, the power and the importance of forgiveness, forgiveness. So in this parable, Jesus Christ is teaching the importance of forgiveness. So uh, we will learn more about it. Let us be in a very prayerful attitude. Let us pray that the Holy Spirit will teach us. How many of you believe that? It is the Holy Spirit who is teaching us. Amen. Hallelujah. When we surrender ourselves, I, wa I, I, I want to tell once again, you know, it is our duty and responsibility to pray for one another who shares God's word. Amen. It is no one's knowledge or no one's effort, but I believe that we are being prepared by the Holy Spirit. Our effort is there. Our effort is to give place for the Holy Spirit to teach God's word. So therefore, let us be in a prayerful attitude, requesting Sister Asha uh, to teach us God's word. Over to you, Sister Asha. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, Pastor, just tell me where they can see my screen, okay? Yes, we can hear you clearly. We can see your screen. Okay. Yes, we can see it now. Yeah. All right. Uh, Father, even at this time, Lord, I just pray that I would be your mouthpiece and that you would show us what your heart desires from each one of us. Take control, Holy Spirit of God. We want you to, we want your voice being heard, not mine. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the parable of the unmerciful servant is actually a very, very profound parable. It's found only in the book of Matthew. If you see the other synoptic gospels, you're not going to find it. It's only in the book of Matthew. And it speaks about the volumes of the kingdom culture of forgiveness. Now, if I've got to rephrase this name of the parable of the unmerciful servant, I would put it as the parable of me, you, and the king, all right? Now, to give you a little background uh, into, uh, okay, sorry, yeah. Uh, the Jewish laws, the times when Jesus was there with his disciples, the Jewish laws were very absolute and very strict. Uh, as we see in the book of Leviticus, there were so many things given, so many laws, and atonement was very pretty difficult, especially, for example, if a woman com committed adultery, the only consequences would be stoning to death. And uh, most of uh, the atonement was achieved only through specific actions or rituals, right? That's just give you a little background. Now, the Jews, according to biblical historians, had uh, this concept 
I think they took it from the book of Amos, uh, chapter one, I think it's three to 13, if I'm not mistaken, where God decrees judgment on Israel's neighbors, Gaza, Damascus, uh, Tyre. And he's, he says, three times I forgive you, the fourth time it's finished. So they had this <clears throat> concept that we forgive three times and that's it, okay? That's unnecessary to forgive beyond three. So it's possible that at, uh, Peter and the other apostles, uh, apostles knew about these laws and Peter probably being a little more generous in his, and wanted a little commendation, it's possible from Jesus. He said, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? So what does he do? He doubles the amount from three, he makes it six and adds one, he makes it seven. And he expects probably God, I mean, Jesus would give him a pat on the back and says, okay, from three, you've gone to seven. But no, the disciples are totally confounded when he turned around and told them not 70 times, but 70 times, uh, not seven times, sorry, but 70 times seven. Now, this must have stupefied each one of them. Now, why did Jesus say 70 times seven? We all know that seven is a perfect, complete number of God. But when you, when, you, uh, when you compare scripture with scripture, this term for, uh, 70 times seven is 490. So where do we find that 490? In the book of Daniel, chapter nine, Gabriel visits Daniel as he's interceding for his sins and the sins of Israel. And he says, 70 sevens are decreed for the nation to make atonement for their wickedness and to usher in righteousness. Now, when we look at 490, was, that was probably 90 years in time, right? But when we look at what Jesus was talking, he was being more symbolic in what he said. It was not the time, it was how much the extent of his mercy. <clears throat> so basically, it was it, 490 pictures the patience and the mercy of God. It's unlimited grace. Of course, there's an expiry time to everything, but it pictures unlimited grace. <coughs> Now, the parables, like many other parables, they tell us that there is a time of reckoning where each one of us, as you can read uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of God so that each of us, now here Paul was speaking to the Corinth church, may receive what is due to us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. He was talking to believers. He was talking to the people in the church. So, <clears throat> so there is a day of reckoning and uh, where books will be open accounts will be settled and each one of us will have to stand before the king. All right, now here we have coming to the parable, here we have the first uh, merciful, uh, the unmerciful servant. He's got a huge debt, a very huge debt to pay. 10,000 talents is probably uh, the highest recorded amount in the Bible, uh, uh, considering it was a debt, okay? I mean, I, I know David I must have, uh, David gave about 100,000 for the, for, the, for the temple, though he was not allowed to build it. But in, time, in terms of repayment of a debt, this is probably the highest recorded amount, 10,000 talents. Okay, now here is the uh, unmerciful servant, this man who comes uh, before the king and says, uh, I cannot pay, he's called. And the king says, okay, take this guy, take his wife and his children and sell them. Now, it's a very tragic scene during those times uh, those laws, Jewish laws could be pretty uh, brutal, okay? Uh, it was not the Jewish law, more, uh, I think, the, the law of the, debt, uh, the of the creditors. Yes, it was the law of the creditors. You do not pay. Everything is taken from you. Your wife is taken from you. Your children are taken from you. You can run a parable if you come to the uh, widow and prophet Elisha. You remember, her husband was a very good man but he could not pay back his uh, creditors, he died, and she was left with her two sons. And she was uh, so disturbed, she runs to Elisha and says, the creditors are coming to take my sons away. So those were the laws, the hard and fast laws. Now let's take a look at the debt the servant owed. He owed the king was 10,000 talents. Now, if we just have to kind of break it up. One talent equals 6,000 denarii or drachma, and one denarius, just one denarius was considered a fairly uh, daily wage for a laborer. So you'd probably get 30 and maybe 360 for the year. So now if you multiply it, 10,000 talents would be an approximate wage for 150 to 200,000 years. Can you see 
the extent of this debt. It was unpayable. Let's go forward a little. Now, what does he say? What does the first person say? Master, have patience with me and I will pay you. Number one, he does not acknowledge that the debt that he has is unpayable. He thinks he can pay it and work it all by himself. He does not ask for forgiveness. You take note of this, but he asks for time. Now, this, is, this kind of represents those who believe salvation by works. You know, I can buy my salvation. Give me time, I can buy it. No, you'll never be able to buy it. It's a free gift. It comes with a cost, but it's a free gift. You could never buy a salvation. So this first unmerciful servant could represent even those who believe salvation by works. Okay? All right. Now, how did the king respond? Then the master was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him his debt. I think the NIV version speaks, uh, it took pity on him. I think pity would be uh, a degree of intensity of an emotion. I think uh, pity is, is a very mild word. When he says moved with compassion, as in, as in the parable of the Good Samaritan, <coughs> the others who passed by this man who was, uh, who was robbed and beaten and broken and left on the road to die, they probably, some of them has, just have had pity and walked by but the good Samaritan was the one who had compassion because he lifted him up and took him and cared for his needs. So this is showing you that the master was a very, very compassionate man. He knew, number one, he knew he could not pay the debt. He did not have a, a, a payment scheme, no payment plan. Okay, you can, pay, you can pay it in installments. No, he recognizes the fact that the servant will never be able to pay the debt. It's beyond him. He cancels the debt entirely and forgives him. Now that makes you wonder, how did this unmerciful servant ever get into such a debt? That is, you know, that's that, that's pretty huge even for the human mind to understand or fathom or reason. But if you turn it around, maybe we could ask the question, how did we ever get into this debt? Sin, the depravity of sin that cost God a lot, the depravity of our sins, but his mercy, and yours. So what is, he's forgiven. This unmerciful servant comes out and he finds another man who owes him. Now, what does the other man own? A paltry hundred denarii, absolutely nothing. It's like, you know, change, yes. So what does he do? He does not acknowledge the compassion of the king. Everyone is given a choice. Now, he chooses to forget the kindness that was shown to him. Neither does he accept the fact that the, the debt has an unrepayable nature. He will never, ever be able to pay that debt. He thinks he can pay it off. That's his foolishness. His heart is so hardened by his ingratitude and arrogance that he fails to reciprocate the king's mercy. We, we can all reflect and, you know, on these uh, on, uh, on these uh, statements, I mean, what God has revealed. And as a result of the hardening of his heart, he fails to show the same compassion that he so graciously received. So hardening of the heart is a very dangerous thing. It, it, shows, uh, it shows us areas where we need to be very careful about. All right, so what does he do? He literally holds him by his throat and chokes him and demands that he be paid back. Yes, it is. What does the wicked servant do? He grabs and chokes the one who owes him a very small amount by comparison to the debt he owed the king. He demands that he pays it back. He ignores the plea of the one who begs him to be patient and to give him time. But these were the exact words that he himself used before the king and then has him thrown into prison without mercy. All right? Okay. So what was the difference between the two debts? The first debt could never be paid back, never, given all the time, lifetime. 200,000 years uh, is beyond. The second probably could be paid back because it was just three months wages, 100 denarii. So the time for us to reflect is here, is are we like the unmerciful servant? seriously reflect and look within the depth of our hearts, unwilling to acknowledge or recognize that our unpayable debt has been canceled and forgiven? Or are we eternally grateful for God's mercy and in true gratefulness willing to forgive our brethren or anyone else who may have hurt us? 
which is comparatively a very, very tiny debt. Now the debt was forgiven. We need, we need to go a little beyond this and run a parallel to God and his son, yes. But being an absolutely perfect, pure, holy and a righteous God, he cannot just wave the debt, debt off. There's always a deficit somewhere because now he had to pay it from his treasury. So justice had to be done. And God paid the debt from his own treasury through his son, Jesus Christ. When you read Colossians 2, 13 and 14, it says, and you who are dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, we were in an unpayable debt. God made a life together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Every court has a legal demand. That is why we have prosecutors, we have defendants, we have the judge, we have lawyers, we have the jury. And likewise, it is in the heavenly courts. Then he set it aside, nailing it to the cross. So our unpayable debt was taken and nailed to the cross. Now, when the people who had actually witnessed the unmerciful servant being shown, shown so much of grace and mercy, when they saw his uh, his behavior and his unmerciful attitude towards a fellow uh, debtor, they were very disturbed. They went back to the king and reported all that they saw. Again, running a battle, who do you think these messengers are? They are the angels. They're God's faithful messengers. They not only bring down messages to humans as seen in the scriptures, Gabriel, Michael, all of them, yeah, but they also report back to God everything they see and they hear. And it's recorded in the books. Now, the king being the king and having all authority, there was no need for him to bring him bring this unmerciful servant in his presence. He could have told the soldiers, just take him and dump him in the jail. He had all the authority to do that. But our God is just. He never mets, he never gives out punishment without no, telling you what you're going to be punished for. So he brings in the unmerciful servant. He makes it known to him. Sorry. Yes. Let me just. Yes. Yes. What does the king do? He condemns the servant. He has to tell him where he has gone wrong and his unmerciful act. He reminds the servant that in forgiving his unpayable debt, which is a standard for forgiveness, the servant failed to keep. Then after having cleared everything, where there was no argument against anything that God decreed, he handed him over to the tormentors to be tortured till they could pay it back. Now, uh, I believe according to biblical uh, scholars, these tormentors were basically under the Roman civil law, they, uh, the Jews were allowed uh, for the payment of debts. They could even torture, uh, torture the debtors, the creditors could uh, torture the debtors till they paid back. So there was a standard at that time, though as cruel as it may, may sound to us today, but probably Peter and the rest, Jesus was talking in reality, they could connect to what Jesus was saying. The, but the big question is now, can the debt be paid back? Never. Now the unmerciful servant, after he was condemned and thrown to prison, he could not deny the king's perfect justice. Now let's see, Another part of the parable, it says, who forgave first? Was it the king or the servant? The king accepts us as we are. As you see in Romans 5, it says, God demonstrates his love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He cancels our debt and he pays the debt through his son. He forgives freely and his forgiveness does not depend on our righteous standing before him. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 says, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by his grace, his mercy, that you have been saved. A grace and mercy that you could never, never measure. Now, there are certain scriptures here that I've put together to reflect on. As Matthew 5, 7 says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. When you show mercy and your forgiveness, remember God takes note of it, and you will be shown mercy. I will be shown mercy. Luke 12, 48 says, from everyone to whom much is given, much will be asked. If you have been given and I have been given much forgiveness, 
then that much forgiveness will be asked from us. Luke 12, 47 says, and that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. And one who did not know his master's will will be beaten with a few stripes. So this speaks about degrees of punishment. Okay? So there's a consequence to a lot of things here. So what does the 10,000 talents represent? It represents our debt to God. Unpayable, absolutely unpayable. The petty hundred denarii in comparison represents our debt to each other. So in the light of God's mercy granted to me, do I have the right not to forgive others? I've got to ask that question again and again. In the light of how much God has forgiven me, do I have the right not to forgive others? Absolutely not. Can we forgive like Jesus? I, I mean, we can say, you know, I'm, I'm not like Jesus. I don't have that kind, not by our strength. You'll never be able to do anything by your strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit who grants you the supernatural ability to forgive. This also is the supernatural grace of God. If you're willing to take one step, God will go 100 or maybe a 1,000 steps to help you. Now, being, now this comes to another part. For example, I just, want, I just want to, as I was reflecting on this, being freely forgiven is God's act of mercy. All right? Yeah. But can we just keep on going on in this and not reciprocating in the way that he wants us? Now, being freely forgiven is God's act of mercy, but in order to retain that forgiveness, in order, I repeat that, in order to retain that forgiveness, you have to let that forgiveness flow to others. Yes, it says, it's like when you buy things from a grocery store, does it have an expiry date? Yes. Your Emirates ID has expiry date? Yes. Your birth certificate will expire the day we leave this earth. So everything has an expiry date. So in order to be freely give, forgiven and to retain that forgiveness, you have to let that forgiveness flow to others. That brings me to, uh, when I think of the Lord's Prayer, uh, you know, there's a part that says, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. It says, when you come before the throne of God, you be careful with your words. He's a holy God, let your words be few. And he says, as we forgive. So if I forgive 10%, in other words, I'm asking God, God, I've forgiven 10%. Now you can forgive me 10%. No, when we go to God, we want complete forgiveness. Likewise, that is expected of us to forgive. And it's not worth, unforgiveness will only eat you. Like someone said, uh, it is not what people eat uh, that uh, destroys them. It, it is what eats them that destroys them. And unforgiveness is the root cause of so many things. So when you do that, when you let that forgiveness flow to others, God will open doors of opportunities for you to pass it on. Now we have a few examples of forgiveness, few people to reflect on. Joseph forgave his brothers who had plotted to harm him and he chose not to take revenge. Again, there's a choice everywhere, a choice has been given. If a choice is not given, then we can't call him a God of love then it would be dictatorship if a choice is not given. Yes, God is God. Is, he's not about love. He is love. That is why he gives choice. That's one of the reasons why he did not take out that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He gives man a choice because there's always a contention from the enemy. He's always challenging God. So though he was in a position not to forgive, Joseph, Joseph chose to forgive. He freely forgave. Elisha forgave this, uh, the Syrian army. You remember the time when Elisha's servant said, he said, Master, I can see the army is so huge. And he was uh, terrified. And what did Elisha pray? He said, Lord, open his eyes. He saw chariots around and that outnumbered the Syrian army. And what does Elisha do? He asked God, blind these guys. And then he leads them right into the enemy camp, that's the Israel camp. And the king says, can we just finish them off? He says, no, feed them. And what happens? What was the consequence of that good, blessed response? Do not repay evil with evil, but repay evil with good. The Syrian army never troubled Israel again. There's always good coming when you, when you forgive. Now, Corrie ten Boom, I do not know how many of you have heard of her, but uh, 
If you ever get the chance, please uh, watch the movie, The Hiding Place. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful movie. Uh, Corrie ten Boom uh, was an Austrian and, uh, and they, they were Jews and they had their little business in Austria. But when the Nazis invaded, they were all separated. I think only she and her sister were there in one, her father died in some other. So the entire family was split. And it's not that they were, they were pretty wealthy people. I mean, had a decent living amongst uh, society. She recognized the Nazi guard at the concentration camp who had brutally treated her and her sister. Her sister died in the camp. She watched her sister die. She watched the sister being brutally treated. And when he stuck out his hand to shake hands with her, you know, the memories came back. It, it was like blood, blood rushed to her head and she didn't want to take his hand. But the voice of the Lord, I believe, spoke to her in one of the interviews that she had given says, how much has he forgiven me? And she stretched out her hand and shook his hand. She said, it was as if, you know, there was a rush of peace in her heart, as if she was kind of set free from something that had literally trapped her. As Paul says in Romans 12, 21, do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, when we look at the entire thing, what was Peter's question? He said, how long do I forgive? Seven times. And Jesus answered, how much have you been forgiven? Now, to conclude today's message, we are left with one crucial question. When I come, when you come to the God's throne of grace, what do you seek? Do you seek justice or do you seek mercy? I just want to leave you with this note. And I pray that each one of us would reflect in our hearts and pay heed to what God has to tell us because he wants to richly bless us. And, you know, uh, like someone said, you know, uh, the most blessed marriage is a marriage where there are two forgiving partners. Amazing. You know, a heavenly marriage, I would call that. Yes, yeah, so I'm just going to leave here now with this note. When you come to throne, uh, God's throne of grace, Ask yourself, do I seek justice or do I seek mercy? Yeah. God bless you all. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Sister. <coughs> Such a powerful teaching today. We heard from Sister Asha about the, the importance of forgiveness, the importance of Christian forgiveness. Um, I just want to read that scripture once again. Please send your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21. It is just a continuation of what uh, Sister Asha was uh, uh, telling and uh, teaching us from the scripture. In the Bible, we see like this. Then came Peter to Jesus. Then came Peter to Jesus and asked and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. There is a question there. Now, that word starts by saying, then came Peter to Jesus with this very difficult and a very important question over there. The question of, or the subject of forgiveness. How often should I forgive? It's not how, how often can I forgive? How often should I forgive? Now, when that word starts by saying, then came Peter, we'll have to read just a couple of words about it. Then we will understand how and when can a Christian would be able to forgive no matter what is being done. Now that is what, that is how we need to understand. As we heard uh, a lot of questions which was, which was taught today, how is it possible, Lord? I'm struggling. One of the greatest practical challenges is, Lord, I'm struggling, O oh God. 
So some of the questions that I want to ask this, this evening is this, does forgiveness, forgiving means forgetting? Does it mean to forget? Does when I say I forgive you, humanly speaking, do we really forget what has been done or what I have, have I done to others? Does that really mean that? How do I justify these things? And when is it possible for a believer, a child of God, to really practice the way of Christ? Let me tell you a few things. The way of Christ is the way of God. The way of Christ is the way of God. Now, as soon as Peter, Apostle Peter, asked this question, Jesus begins by saying in verses 22, then Jesus said unto him, I say unto thee, until seven times, but until 70 times seven, then therefore, he says, therefore is the kingdom of God likened unto this. Then Jesus connects this to the kingdom of God. Who can enter into the kingdom of God is being connected with the question that Peter asked. So, this concept is all about the way of Christ. This is how the way of Christ is. Now, a couple of months ago, somebody asked, what is the way of Christ? What was the teaching of Christ? Some people think Christ was a very good teacher. He was a man who was an example to the world. He led a very good moral life. And beyond that, they are not willing to go. But what does the Bible say? What is the way of Christ? And let me tell you what the way of Christ is. The way of Christ is the way to God. Let me begin by saying the way of Christ is the way to God himself. The way of Christ is the way to life. It is the Zoe life that Christ gave and came to teach. The Zoe life, the life filled with dynamic power because the Holy Spirit who has been known or translated with human limitations with the word called dunamis. When the Holy Spirit dwells in a person, the way of Christ becomes a dynamic life or the way of life. The way of Christ is a way to truth. The way of Christ is the way to truth. The way of Christ is the way of love. There are different kinds of love according to the, 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 the literature of Apostle Paul. But I'm not getting into all those things. But the way of life is the way of love. The way of life, the way of Christ is the way of joy. The way of Christ is the way of peace. The way of Christ is the way of unity. The way of Christ is the way of prayer. And finally, I want to tell you, the way of Christ is the way to forgiveness. The way of Christ is the way of forgiveness. In this parable, Jesus came to that important way in which he wants to tell to the people when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He wants to tell to Apostle Peter, if you need to forgive, you need to come to the way of Christ. Now, we started by reading verses 21 when we said, then came Peter to Jesus. Now, let me read some of the verses to you from verses 18. Verily I say unto you, these are the words of Jesus Christ. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever he shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And it says, again I say unto you that, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my father, which is in heaven. And he says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. 
There am I in the midst of them. Then the next word says, then Apostle Peter came to Jesus with this great topic, forgiveness. Jesus Christ is telling to the disciples, I am giving you great power. What you bound will be bound. What you lose will be loosed. When two of you get together and pray, it shall be given unto you. And Jesus said, when I am where two of you gather in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Immediately something bubbled in the life of Peter. And what, what bubbled was about the topic of forgiveness. And he brings, Lord, when you say, when you are there, when we gather in the name of Jesus, and when you say that I am there in the midst of them, he says, Lord, is it possible to, to tackle this issue called forgiveness? I want to tell you, people of God, this is one of the way in which I understood when I read the scripture. How is it possible to forgive someone in the way of Christ is when the presence of God fills our house? Amen. When the presence of God fills my heart, when the presence of God fills that situation in which I'm having a problem, I want to tell you, we can take a bold step and say, I forgive. Why? It's not because of me. It's because of the presence of God. Amen. I want to tell you, people of God, we may be struggling in this area of not able to forgive. We heard this beautiful story in which it was so beautifully explained today about 2,200,000 years of wages not being able to forgive, not being able to give it back, forgetting. And still he says, I can give it back. I can give it. God says, no, it is impossible. And the good king said, I forgive you, forget it. I forgive you, I forgive you. I want to tell you there are lots of deposits of unforgiveness in our lives. According to human terminology or according to human humanness, it is impossible for us to forgive. All those things which has been stacked in our life, it is impossible to forgive. It is not the big thing that, that came in one day. It are small things that has been accumulated in our lives for many years down the line. And how is it possible? How can we forgive? I want to tell you a small, you know, a, a small thought that I have. When the presence of God comes into my life, that presence of God leads me to the way of Christ. The way of Christ is to forgive. Let us not take any credit by saying I was able to forgive that person or these things because of my ability. No, today as a child of God, let us completely cover ourselves and say, Lord, because of your presence, I was able to forgive. Because of your ability, because when I came into the way of Christ, I was able to forgive somebody. Without coming into the presence of God, it is impossible for you and me. We can be pastors, teachers, prophets, evangelists, apostles, or, or whoever we are. It is impossible for us to forgive. We could have heard the teaching of forgiveness. Yes, you need to forgive. You, need, you should not have bitterness. But still, I'm not able to do. But today, I want to tell you. We need to come just one step ahead, one step behind and say, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I. When I am there, forgiveness starts to manifest. Hallelujah. That's why they said, when two of you can agree, when Lord, when I am there in your midst, two of you can agree. Without the presence of God, no Christian can live a holy life. No Christian can live a uni united life. No families can live in harmony without the presence of God. As soon as Jesus thought, taught, and, and as soon as Jesus said, when two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Something bubbled in the life of Peter. Peter, Lord, what about this topic? We heard the background. I don't want to go back to the background. And it has been said, uh, the way of Christ is a way to forgiveness. You know, I, I, I just came across this quotation of Nelson Mandela once he said, 
Forgiveness liberates the soul. That is why it is such a powerful weapon. Nelson Mandela, we know about him. I'm not just, you know, I'm magnifying a person here. He came up with this thought. Forgiveness is liberating a soul. And he said, that is why it is a powerful weapon. People of God, that weapon has been handed over into the hands of a child of God. That weapon, that way of Christ is been handed over into the hands of God. You know, I just came across one more thing when I just read a couple of things. A very, very famous poet said, I am jealous about one thing about Christians. And when they asked, what was it? Why are you so jealous about Christians? And she said like this, I'm jealous because of the way of forgiving. They forgive. They have been taught to forgive. They practice forgiveness. This is what I cannot understand. I may be great. I may be a great, a great author. I've written many books, but I cannot learn and understand how people, Christians, forgive. I want to tell you this evening, people of God, we are to forgive. How is it possible today when the presence of God fills my heart, when the presence of God fills my family, let us take, bring that really bubbles in our life. There are a few things that will bubble up, which is impossible for to dilute. Let us bring that and say, Lord, when I have the presence of God in the place where I am in the church, when I worship God, I feel the presence of God. Bring that bubbles in in your life. Bring those things that really finds it so difficult to dilute. Bring it up and say, Lord, I have an issue here. What is it? I see your presence, powerful presence, Lord. This is my problem. Lord, please do it. God strengthens us. Amen. God will make us a way through. God will help us hold our hands and say, yes, in this matter, I will. I will help you. I will help you. Amen. Somebody said like this, there are two sides of forgiveness. One is decisional forgiveness. And the other thing is emotional forgiveness. Decisional forgiveness involves a conscious choice to replace ill with good will. But emotional forgiveness makes you to go away from negative feelings and no longer dwell on the wrongdoing. These things are very, very easy to say, people of God. But one thing what I learned this evening is this. When I would just meditate upon God's word, when my presence fills you, I will lead you to forgiveness. Amen. No matter what you struggle, we all go through that. We all have bitterness. We all have bitterness. Somebody said like this, forgiveness does not erase the past, but looks upon it with compassion. Forgiveness does not erase the In many places said, your sins are forgiven. Sin no more. Go. Your sins are forgiven. Sin no more. He came to forgive. And in that powerful prayer, we heard from Sister Asha today, the, the, the Lord's Prayer. When you learn the Lord's Prayer, that is the only prayer. I don't see this word I. It is all about us. It's all about us. Our Heavenly Father, forgive us as we. We never see that word I in that. That is such a powerful prayer. But Jesus said, when he prays, say, our, heavenly, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You see how the prayer starts? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In the presence of God, forgiveness can be practiced. This is what I want to tell you this evening. We learned such a powerful and a practical, a practical parable today. If we need to practice forgiveness, let thy kingdom come in my family. Thy kingdom come in my life for God. I may be having the power to bind which will be bound. I may be having the power to loose and it will be, be loosed. I may be having the power to do great things. 
but there are many things that bubbles that we have segregated, set apart. Lord, this is not diluting, Lord. This is being there. What can I do? That's why Jesus said, let thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. The, uh, and as it is in heaven, so in earth. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us as we forgive those who sin against us. This evening, people of God, let us ask the Lord. We read a lot of verses today. We have been forgiven. Colossians 2, 13 to 15. One great thing we need to understand. We have been forgiven. How many of you believe that? Yes, Lord, I have been forgiven. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Because whenever I see the cross, I see I am being forgiven. I am being forgiven. Hallelujah. I am being forgiven. Forgive because you have been forgiven. Colossians 3.13. When i am been forgiven, all the scripture says forgive. Forgiveness restores broken relationships. This is what the Bible teaches. When we practice forgiveness, it restores broken relationships. We pray for families. We pray for ourselves. We pray for our church. We pray for restoration. When will it begin? How will, how will it begin? Forgiveness is the first thing. That will restore a relate, broken relationship. Forgiveness is the path of love. Gospel of Luke. Forgiveness proceeds healing. God tells us to forgive instead of seeking revenge. And being, being grudged against us. Against each other. Jesus has to say one thing. Forgive. On the cross of Calvary. He taught in the gospels. End of the gospels on the cross of Calvary. He said forgive them Lord. For they do not know what they do. When the presence of God is not there, we will crucify Christ. When the presence of God is there, we will worship him for his forgiveness. This evening, I just want to leave with you this one thought. When that man was forgiven, he forgot the mercy of the king. When he came towards the man who had to give him only 100 denarius, he persecuted him. He did not show him compassion. This evening, when much has been given, much has been asked. Amen. When much has been given, much has been asked. Shall we close our eyes this evening and look into God and say, Lord, I am not able to forgive, Lord. When we are not able to forgive, pride grips our life. When pride grips our life, anger of God is against our life. Because the Bible says, I am against the proud. I give grace to the humble. Hallelujah. We are not called to be destroyed. We are not called to live in God's anger. We are called to be, to be, to live, to lead, to live a, a joyful Christian life. Experiencing, thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness. Shall we all unmute for a while and say, thank you, Lord, for the cross. Thank you, Father. Let us just say together, thy kingdom come of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the cross, Master. Thank you, Lord. Jesus said, when two of you gather in my name, I am there. When the presence of God is felt in your life, hallelujah. Come up with that, which is difficult for you to do it. God will help us to help us possible. Whichever problem it is, when you feel the presence of God, come and say, Lord, Thank you. Let your, Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Father, teach me to forgive. Teach me to forgive. Teach me to forgive. Let there be healing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. People of God, open your mouth and start worshiping God. Hallelujah. Let there be healing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let the be united in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let forgiveness, let forgiveness manifest in the name of Jesus because we are in the presence of the Holy God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, 
united in this church in the name hallelujah let there be unity in the office place hallelujah let there be unity with the Christ of God hallelujah oh hallelujah every suicide of God be broken in the mighty name of Jesus hallelujah every way shall be broken in the mighty name of Jesus because when the presence of God is there I mean hallelujah bring up your shoes bring up your shoes bring up your shoes hallelujah God will make a way God will make a way God will make a way thank you Jesus hallelujah Father, we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for the healing of God. Thank you for the oneness of God. Thank you for your presence of God. Hallelujah. Lord, thank you that joy is multiplying. Hallelujah. Thank you for the joy which has been multiplying of God. Thank you for the joy in the family. Thank you for the joy within our children, O oh Master. Thank you for the joy that grows within ourselves, O oh God. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Sister Acha. Over to Sister Hazel.